Thanks for downloading this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. You can find the full schedule and listen back to all our shows at ttradio.org. This show is brought to you in partnership with the Happy Confident Company, who provide clinically approved, ready to go wellbeing and mental health programs to help your pupils thrive in only 10 minutes a day. Visit www.happyconfident.com to find out more. Enjoy the podcast. This programme has been brought to you by the Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready to go, wellbeing and mental health programme will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and wellbeing tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. Thank you. Thank you for hosting, Lucy. And good evening, everybody. Good evening to our listeners, those that are listening live and those that are joining us after the show. I hope that you've had a lovely Wednesday so far. Thankfully, the weather has been not too bad here in London. I'm not too sure where everyone is based, but I have to say we're doing better because May's weather has not been what I would have liked. I thought we were in spring, but um, the weather seems to be slightly confused, but it's getting there. It's getting there. So today we are speaking about a topic that I wouldn't say it's the most... Oh, what's the term that I'm looking for? Not the most popular thing to talk about, um, but it did come to me just in light of a lot of the conversations that I've been seeing on Edu Twitter about behaviour. So today we are talking about teacher training and teacher standards. Now, it does seem like a bit of a tenuous link between that and behavior but it will all come together as you listen to the show so today i have a very lovely guest joining me uh, we have andy davy hello andy that i have to, and this is completely off topic it's not to do with education so i do hope admin won't just pull me off air but <laughs> i am very very full right now because I've just had dinner I had to rush dinner because I lost track of time and I had a jacket potato but we don't really have jacket potatoes much in our house we have other forms of potato but not jacket potatoes and they weren't you know the biggest but I had I put two on my plate and I got about halfway through one and I was really full so if I do sound a bit sleepy I might have the itis this evening because of half a jacket potato I didn't even touch the second one there was no way but um yeah (laughs) I do apologize if I stumble over words or if I even you know nod off halfway through the show I am full up but I have a happy belly so that's not too bad right okay it seems like we still are waiting on Andy in which case I will just crack on so like I said we are talking about teacher training and teacher standards. Now, I remember training as a primary school teacher. So my PGCE is in primary education with music. So I had an elective attached to mine. And I remember feeling like there was just so much to cover and I didn't feel adequately prepared for just going into the big wide world of teaching especially when it came to subject knowledge there were you know primary school teachers we teach everything of course and it just seemed like you could never teacher training just didn't prepare you for all the subject knowledge that you would need essentially so I thought right that's you know part half the battle is knowing your subject and knowing what it is you are teaching The other half of it is your planning, your organisation, your behaviour management and all those kind of things, which is what you are assessed against when you are training. So you have, well, what we know to be the teacher standards. So I find it quite interesting that I just I was reflecting on my teaching and I thought, hold on, I do not remember the last time anybody (laughs) mentioned 
the teacher standards to me and I teach every day the last time I really heard about the standards is when I was training and I just thought that that was quite interesting that it's your whole life <laughs> during your training year and then all of a sudden you're in a school you've got a class of your own or several classes if you're in secondary school and it, it's already mentioned so that was where my line of thinking was with tonight's show and we're going to unpack that um quite a bit today so i believe we've got andy here now good evening andy probably okay. heard a bit of my preamble but i think it would be for the listeners to get to know you a little bit so please do share with us what is your current stage in life what are you doing um and yeah just tell us a bit about yourself who are you um so my name's andy davy um i'm currently on a secondary science pgc at the university of southampton um actually i just graduated last year um in a degree in biomedical science so i go straight from an undergrad to doing the PGC and yeah you know um literally got about two more weeks left of actual teaching on the course so we're at the right at the end of the year amazing and why did you choose to go into teaching because I'm sure there are a myriad of careers you could have chosen with biomedical science but why did you feel you wanted to go down the teaching route um, so part of my degree and in the third year was a lot of science communication and outreach sort of things. And I really got to this point where I really enjoyed not researching science, but talking about science way more. And it made me reflect on what really got me into the degree and interested in science. And I think my experiences at school and the people who got me interested in science originally was a big factor into that. Mm, amazing. Thank you for sharing that because... You know, I'm sure you're very aware that the perception of teaching in the media at the moment and in general, when you have conversations, you know, it isn't always the most favourable. Um, you hear people saying, I suppose just complaining, <laughs> complaining about teaching, you know, it, it's hard work, children are this, they're that, staff, workload, and all those things kind of um, are thrown about. So it's you know, I personally commend you <laughs> for joining the profession. It is a great one. But of course, I am very biased. Um, but I did want to ask with, you know, there are so many training routes at the moment. You chose the PGC. Um, was there any particular reason that that was the route you chose as opposed to doing a school-based route or Teach First or any other roots because there's quite a few of them now but why was the PGC your your choice um well personally for me it was that I knew I wanted to stay in Southampton mm. and so staying at the university was one option and then I did apply for other school direct ones in the area which I didn't actually get and then I got the PGC at Southampton as that sort of second option um I never really considered Teach First, really, because I'd heard not great things about it. Mm. But that's what I've heard and comparing it to the PGC. Um, but, yeah, that was my sort of reasoning to do the PGC, like the uni-led route. It was kind yeah. of just what was around here and what was offered to me, yeah. Fab. Thank you. Um I feel like I'm having to think so far back to my own experiences. But um, do, well, I suppose the, it's quite a vague question. So you can take this in any direction you wish to. But how are you finding your PGCE? Is it meeting up to the expectations you had? Have you, did you go into it? you know, thinking that it would be one way based on conversations you've had with people and found out that it's a completely different way. Um, yes, I guess just tell us about your experiences, your highs, your lows, challenges, your wins, the whole lot. We are very interested. I mean, I think going into it, I was incredibly nervous. And, you know, even just on interview day, they're telling you it's going to be, you know, you've got these expectations for how difficult it is. It's challenging, are you sure? Like, have you thought about this kind of thing? This is what you're going to be doing. This is expectations. And you read a lot online saying this is the hardest year of the teaching career and things like that. It's something that gets 
when I was looking into it originally. And I mean, it's easier now when I get to the end to think back, thinking it wasn't so bad. It was just very, very, very busy. And there's always something to do and, and always something to reflect upon and something you've already done kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and a constant cycle which doesn't really feel like it's going anywhere at some point. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, I feel quite positive at the end. It's been, there have been some, some interesting downs and, mm -hmm. um, and most of them have been like, but to where it gets to the end, it's just been a sort of looking back. I'm quite happy <laughs> with it. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. And how are you finding the balance between university work and teaching? So you're planning, you're marking and all of those kinds of things. How are you finding that balance? Um, so the way that our courses ran, it's the four day placement at school, Monday to Thursday and then the Friday we're at uni doing um, basically some knowledge things, some teaching practice stuff. And we do the three assignments during the year, which make up the, the master's level side of it, um, mm. which the first one was probably the most difficult when everything is coming at you at a really, really insane pace of so much things you're learning for the first time and even the first time and getting a grip of planning and marking. And then you get to Christmas and it's, oh no, I've got this assignment now I need to do over Christmas. And that was probably the, one of the hardest bits you never really got that chance to to switch off really for Christmas unless you were continuously working on this assignment during mm. the term time without having that knowledge of how to teach already because you're just doing everything for the first time and it's quite stressful to pick up um but as it's got on I think and as the nature of the assignments have changed uh, so the first assignment's a big literature report uh a big literature essay and then we've kind of gone into data collection and uh, whole school issues has become a bit more manageable as you've got mm. more experience as well um yeah i mean and universities kind of they try to get us to do these other tasks as well that we should be competing in school mm. um which have which were good at first when you're just sort of you know it's a part of all this trying to experience as many different things at once it felt like that the university was trying to get us to do yeah um but then sort of <laughs> you would do it with your school mentor and they would be a bit more like as a sort of tick box that you've done that for the week kind of thing it wasn't something mm. that was strictly strictly followed it was a, a nice thing to talk about but then as the year goes on those sorts of things go to the to the, the back front and it's sort of like a quick chat about yeah yeah, I feel like I completely understand. <laughs> if there was one thing I remember from my PGCE, it was having to do a reflective journal. They really pushed this reflective journal. After you've watched a lesson, put something in your journal. After this lecture, put something in your reflective journal. And I probably did about five accounts in there. And yeah, like you said, once the pace started, um getting faster that reflective journal I don't think I knew where it was for about eight weeks and then we had an assignment where we needed our reflective journal so I'll pick three events from your and then you had to do some kind of assessment on it so I had to pick that up very quickly but I completely understand <laughs> about those tasks that the uni makes you do um so yes, thank you for sharing your experience. It's interesting to hear a secondary or a subject-based PGC, should I say, because um, mine was primary, so we did lots of subjects at a very vague level, whereas I guess for you, it's you're looking at science and the teaching and pedagogy of science quite deeply. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, uh, particularly with science, it's a very... Because I'm technically I'm a biology specialist, so oh, nice. that's what I signed up to do, but I'm with, it's all one big cohort of scientists. Right. And then we have our two tutors that are trying to teach us who, who one's a body specialist, one's a physics specialist. Mm. We, and it's sort of, we're teaching sort of out of the specialty as well. So there's, I don't know, I can't really compare with other subjects, but you get the feeling that there's a, the subject knowledge part is something that you have to be, it's quite wide to be able to teach all three. 
and the tutors are trying their best to cover mm. the main bases of those three. Yeah. Which can feel at times, you know, I'm never going to actually teach this depending on what school I go to kind of thing. I don't mm. need to know this. But, um, and then, yeah, so they're, they're quite heavy on the subject knowledge part on very wow. specific bits of science on a Friday okay. that we do. Okay. Huh, that's interesting. Um, and I love that you're a biology specialist. That that was my best science. <laughs> Did it up until A level. Um, so yes, chemistry and physics I liked, but not as much as biology. I just think it's a lot more relatable because you know, being human and we have all the cells and all those things. Um, yeah, I, I was always drawn a bit more to biology. But it is interesting what you say about the subject knowledge, um, because I feel like that's where teacher training for primary can fall down a bit, just because there's just not enough time to cover the content for all the subjects that primary school teachers have to teach. I suppose with one subject, it's a bit easier, um, but I, I have no doubt that, you know, secondary pgcs have their own their own challenges but i did want to quiz you a bit andy now don't panic it's it's nothing scary <laughs> but for everyone that is listening actually i would like you to to join in and maybe this could be a poll actually to see how many teachers remember but off the top of your head andy do you know all the teacher standards this program has been brought to you by The Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready to go, well-being and mental health program will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and well-being tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. Um I couldn't name all of them. There's about there's two parts and the second yeah. part has about two two bits to it, I think. Mm -hmm. And then the first okay. part has yeah. about eight. Yeah. So as many um, of them as you can remember. Uh, they don't uh, need to be in order. I'm just quite curious to see something here. High expectations. Uh, planning lessons. Um, and then it kind of falls down from there. And then I know this is the two professional ones. I, I, sub <laughs> two of them related to something professional. <laughs> yeah, right. See, I love that. <laughs> That's actually very insightful. <laughs> um, and I asked because when I was training, that was pretty much all that was drummed into us. That was the way we were assessed, essentially. We were assessed against each standard. Um, but I've been in teaching or I've been qualified about five years now and I don't think I've heard it mentioned once <laughs> which is quite interesting to me given that when you're training that was all I heard and I knew them inside out to the point where and this is so embarrassing I don't know why I'm sharing this story but I was watching <laughs> or I happened to come across an episode of Love Island a couple of I don't know how long ago it was but Craig David was on it and his laptop for his DJ set had TS5 on it and I sat there and I said oh TS5 adapt teaching to responding to the strengths and needs of all pupils it was that deeply ingrained <laughs> that I could see TS5 and say what teacher standard that was but I say that to say it was I, almost like it was all the rage but it doesn't seem to have much bearing on on life as as a teacher. And if there are any qualified teachers, um, please do you know join in the conversation. You can tweet or request to speak. But I would love to know how much it comes up in um, in your everyday. <laughs> Mr. Kemper said, "I can probably name half as I have to list them on a track of fortnightly. Definitely not completely. Thank you." And I think actually that's a good point. If you're a, a school mentor for example then you're probably more you'd, you'd work with them more you'd have to see them more regularly because you have to assess your student fair enough um but for the most part it, it's just not something we talk about um so I will go through them just for the benefit of those that can't remember so 
you're right, Andy. We've got part one and part two. So part one is the teaching part. So number one is setting high expectations, which inspire, motivate, and challenge pupils. Number two is promoting good progress and outcomes by pupils. Number three, demonstrates good subjects and curriculum knowledge. Number four, plan and teach well-structured lessons. Number five, adapt teaching to respond to the strengths and needs of all pupils, so differentiation, essentially. Number six, make accurate and productive use of assessment. Number seven, manage behaviour effectively to ensure a good and safe learning environment. And number eight, fulfil wider professional responsibilities. So that was all part one. And part two is about personal and professional conduct. So just the way you act as a teacher, basically, your teacher persona. Um, so yes, if anyone did remember all of those <laughs> off the top of their heads, brownie points for you. I would love to give you a prize, but cost of living crisis can't afford to, but, you know, have a sense of accomplishment for free. But I was looking through this list and I thought it was interesting because I was sat here thinking, do teacher standards need to change with the times, essentially? Because I do find that some of these standards are more easy to implement in some schools than others. Um, and I'll give you an example. And Andy, I'll ask you about your school experience shortly. But I remember TS8 very vividly about fulfilling wider professional responsibilities because the p point there, because it's got other bullet points underneath it, the one that was always a bit of a bone of contention with me was deploying support staff effectively. Um, I don't know if on your training, Andy, you've come across anything to do with TAs or just working with other staff members? Uh, we have in a little bit, yes. But yeah, again, it's a, it's a big thing that my mentor at my, at my school, both schools that I've been placed at, I've talked about as the main bit of feedback a lot of the time. Ah, interesting. Okay, so from... Do you know what? It's really funny because I'm trying to think back to my secondary school experiences and I feel like I don't remember there being many TAs around. And they probably were. They might just not have been in the classroom with me. But how does, or in the schools you've been in, Andy, what does, I mean, do you have extra adults? Do you have one-to-ones? Do you have learning support assistants in the schools that you've been in? Um, so they've been learning support assistants. But, like, the the whole bit about what I've been told is being, you know, to acknowledge them, greet them, talk to them, and have something specific for them to do. That's the bit that's been uh, emphasised to me quite a bit, to have it included in my planning. Mm. So, so okay, just that's not, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, because, I mean, so the point that I was getting at was if you've got a school that is very you know that is financially blessed enough should I say to have support staff in classrooms then of course that is a teacher standard that you can work towards you can tick that box of saying you know I'm working on deploying my staff effectively but I was in a school when I was training at one point where we had to share our TA between three classes so it was a three form entry school I was in year two at the time and yeah we had one one TA for the whole of um for the whole of year two which was three classes so that's all well and good until the day you've got an observation and your TA is nowhere to be found so you know things like that if you've got a school that is working it depends on the school's priorities, I would say, in how well these teacher standards can be um, can be followed, is what I would say. So with your schools, Andy, the ones you've been in, in terms of lesson planning, how does it work? How much freedom do you get? Are you following other teachers' planning? Because I'm sure it up but what's lesson planning been like for you um as a trainee teacher um i would say it's been quite 
intense. So my main placement school, the scheme of work is slightly less defined in the resources that they have that and the expectations for how you should teach it. It's very much down to each teacher, um, mm. which I'm sure is not unusual. But as a trainee teacher coming in where there's not a great deal of set resources, it's been a lot of asking teachers, what do you do to teach this? Can I have your mm. resource kind of thing to start with? Or yeah. going from scratch a lot of the time or a fair bit of the time or looking online for things like that and changing it yourself. So it has been a challenge and I think it's it, it's had value to it because it's making it I've I thought quite deeply about how I want to teach things and why am I doing things. But as a trainee, it's been not easy not to have like a nice centralized bit of resource across the whole department, which mm. wasn't always available. Very for my main placement school, there's basically yeah. nothing that's shared. In my second placement school, there was quite a bit of older resources that were there, but at least it wasn't running around to different teachers asking how they teach each, each and everything all the time. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think it is, like you said, it's great when you've got a bank of resources or old planning that you can kind of look at as a, a starting point or a point, you know, a point of reference. Because, um, again, I've heard of schools that can take all their planning with them, delete it off the system, so there is nothing for the person that's coming after, um, which I would say is not good personal and professional conduct, part two of our teacher standards, but there we are. Um, but yes, you know, with planning and teaching well-structured lessons, I think there is a point to be considered about schools that use schemes. Um, and I don't know if you've come across many, Andy. I don't know if this is a real big primary thing. Um, but in our or in a lot of the schools that I've been in, there have been a range of schemes, schemes for English, schemes for math, schemes for writing. Um, and I guess where you're doing one subject, which is biology, I, I don't know if you have learning schemes in the same way. Have you come across any, Andy? Um, not particularly. Um it just tends to be you're teaching this topic at this time. Um, yeah. This is how many lessons you have. Here's um, our scheme of work, I suppose, that you have online to look at from the textbook mm -hmm. and cover this, these bits across all three sciences. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I think in, in that respect, that teacher standard, um, number four, you know, planning and teaching well structured lessons, I think that's a great way <laughs> that you know you can be assessed because you do without a scheme have to plan your own lessons from scratch like you said sometimes um which does then reflect on you as a teacher and your progress as a teacher um having schemes while they are good um at times <laughs> they can be very rigid and I have seen cases where a lesson hasn't gone the way a trainee wanted because they had to follow a set lesson plan and granted they could have tweaked it but you know again it depends on the school and I think what I'm trying to say is you can only do as well with these standards as the school that you're in um it's interesting because the preamble says for the teacher standards there's a preamble at the top that says teachers make the education of their pupils their first concern and are accountable for achieving the highest possible standards in work and conduct. Teachers act with honesty and integrity, have strong subject knowledge, keep their knowledge and skills as teachers up to date and are self-critical, forge professional, positive professional relationships and work with parents in the best interests of their pupils. And I read all of that and I thought, well, isn't that lovely? <laughs> I thought it was delightful. It was very idyllic. But even just that first bit, teachers make the education of their pupils their first concern. I thought, yes, usually, but it doesn't say anything about the well-being of pupils, the behaviour of pupils. Because I found that no learning can get done if the behaviour is not there and if the well-being of that child isn't there. And I want to ask you, Andy, and anyone else, actually, 
have you found or have you had any experiences where not that you couldn't teach but where you had to deal with something first before you got to the meat of your lesson whether that's behavior whether that's safeguarding concern whether that's a health thing have you had any experiences like that um yeah i think that there's, there's with, with with my challenging classes that i have this year it, it feels like half of it is i'm purely just working on my behavior i guess on the teaching standards on those just purely in those lessons of mm. feeling like I'm trying to um, behave appropriately and act accordingly as our behavior policy at the school dictates. And the thing that I'm always worried about is this sense of right and wrong and following things to the exact, you know, the sense of being fair and I've done the right thing. Mm. Particularly when every lesson I have the normal class teacher there with me, I feel like mm. I'm constantly feeling like when I, particularly with behavior things a sense of not being the total authority sometimes when the experienced teacher's there yeah feeling like I'm trying not to be oh you should have set the attention there or you should you set the attention to that person but you didn't do it to someone over here there's that constant bit of that's the trickier bit that consistency that is being overwatched mm-hmm. by someone else who has who can see everything going on that's the that's something that I sort of struggle with and and you're right, and there's a lot of that kind of indecision can break the lesson down. I mean, I can't really get into the deeper stuff, particularly when it happens in the lesson. Mm, absolutely. And I think that behaviour has been a, a very widely discussed topic at the moment. If you go on edgy Twitter for even 10 minutes and just scroll through your timeline something about behavior will come up something about behavior you know is being debated and I thought it was quite interesting what um TS7 says about that so TS7 manage behavior effectively to ensure a good and safe learning environment I'll read the bullet points underneath It says, have clear rules and routines for behaviour in classrooms and take responsibility for promoting good and courteous behaviour both in classrooms and around school in accordance with the school's behaviour policy, have high expectations of behaviour and establish a framework for discipline with a range of strategies using sanctions and rewards consistently and fairly. Manage classes effectively using approaches which are appropriate to people's needs in order to involve and motivate them. And lastly, maintain good relationships with pupils, exercise appropriate authority and act decisively when necessary. So it's quite a lot there. But my thing came to mind when I was reading this was about having high expectations of behaviour. Because how do you qualify that? Because everyone's high expectations are different. And you mentioned something very key, which is consistency. Now, for me as a trainee teacher, if this is what you are assessing me against about my behaviour management, I might have to manage that in accordance with the school's behaviour policy. And I might not agree (laughs) with that school's behaviour policy. And there have been times where I thought, I know what to do here, but I will step on some toes and I need to pass. I need to get my qualified teacher status. So I'm not going to do what I feel would work. But then that doesn't look good on your assessment. So it's it's quite a lot to weigh up. Um, And I don't know what you've what you think about that Andy because you did mention it briefly but have there been times where your personal beliefs about behavior and your personal methods of behavior management have com- have been in conflicts with the school that you've been in um I wouldn't say so no I would say it's more just like like having that consistency between all the situations and how I use the school's behavior policy to follow it because the school behaviour policy that I'm in is a, it's not as strict as between teachers, kind of, um, mm. from teacher to teacher of how they interpret it and how they take their warnings, how they take their warning systems, for example, and how mm. they reflect that to the student. Yeah. So it kind of changes. So 
it's about sort of developing my own way of making things clear that I'm trying to be consistent and it's and and I think the thing that's interesting is showing what a high expectation looks like between different mm-hmm. classes. Yeah. Because I feel like for some classes I'm perhaps that's good for them and then another class is just completely different and keeping that same expectation is is challenging as a trainee, I think. Yeah. Definitely. And it can be that conflict with the teacher that the class based teach that class teacher basically and you as a trainee um because I found it, it is around high expectations I feel that my expectations for me aren't unreasonable <laughs> but maybe it's just not something that is a priority to the class teacher there was a point when I made it a real thing about presentational books like I really liked the dates to be underlined properly you know the dates had to look nice and things had to be stuck in a certain way like for me that was having a high expectation but the class teacher was kind of just like yeah we've got other things to do you know it's like I don't really care what the books look like as long as we get the work done um and it is that that conflict which is why I think with these future standards, yes, they're great for, you know, having a, a blanket um, set of criteria, essentially, for all teachers. But it's almost like it can differ from school to school, or maybe they should change depending on the school that you are in or the local authority that you're in, depending on how you want to scale it. Because, again, like I was talking about with TS8, the wider professional responsibilities, if you're in a school that has a TA in every classroom, amazing. But you might not be. You know, they, they might have one TA for two year groups, which I've also seen. And also, you know, that whole making a positive contribution to the wider life, getting involved in the school. I've been in schools where it's the TAs that do break duties and lunch duties and the teachers don't really have to do any of that. So it's then, okay, what part of the wider life of the school can I get involved in does that teacher standard apply to me in this um in this way so I don't know if it's worth schools just having a look at these standards and thinking right how can we tweak this for our school and how can we make it so the teachers in our school are being held to a high standard, but a standard that makes sense to the environment we're in, if that makes sense. So that was my thought process with that. Um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, Andy? Um, it's about, it, particularly when I'm training, so I do the two placements you do. The way our PGC mm-hmm. works is that we do one long placement throughout the year, and then from January to February, we go to um, our focus school for a half term. And it's it's usually a very contrasting school in terms of behaviour or the way it's ran or something like that. But it's meant to give us a different perspective on teaching. And it was that bit about having high expectations. So I went from quite a well-behaved school where the kids are already quite well-behaved to a different school where the, the expectations for behaviour, at least when I came in and saw it, watching the class teachers that I saw there, was very different. I thought, oh, I would, I thought if this happened in... In, in the school that I'm currently at, it just I wouldn't have a good feedback that lesson kind of thing. Mm. Um, and it was, and, and the things that my mentor were talking about was at the school was very little on actual behaviour and more on other things. And I don't know if that was just the way that that placement was meant to really run or or something like that. But it felt that expectation was very different. And I ended up coming back to my main school thinking, oh, I need to turn it back up again, kind of thing. I've been mm. slacking on this, but they didn't have an expectation of me as a trainee teacher to be doing that as much. At least that's what it felt like, contrasting those two placements. Yeah, absolutely. And even with that, just having schools that are so different, part of me is thinking, well, is using the teaching standards, is that a fair way of assessing how good a teacher really is because it's like you were saying you could be in a school with you know brilliant behavior for whatever reason maybe their behavior policy works maybe they've got a really strict slt maybe the behavior is brilliant for a 
variety of reasons. But then if you are in a school that has excellent behaviour, do you really know what your behaviour management is like? Because you might not have needed to do it much because the children are all fabulous. And I know that <laughs> I probably have some teachers thinking, okay, where is this place? Take me there. Like, honestly, take me now. It probably doesn't exist. But I'm thinking if that's where someone is training and that's they're being assessed by these teacher standards, I'm thinking, mm, I don't know how good your behaviour management is because your your teaching is so fantastic and the behaviour is so fantastic. The same way if I go to a school that has lots of schemes, lots of different schemes of work, I might not know how good your planning is because all the plans are done for you. You know, it, it's a, that's how the school runs things. It could be a school that maybe doesn't have so much um what's the word I'm looking for the attainment levels in the classroom might be fairly even maybe they stream so I don't know how good your differentiation is which is TS5 so I'm thinking now is could there be a more effective trainee teachers and you as a trainee Andy um what has your experience of your feedback and assessment been so what has that process of you improving essentially and been like so with your observations and your feedback forms your mental meetings how have they worked for you have they been helpful to you do you think there's another method of assessment that would be beneficial for you in your training um yeah so the way we it works for me is that we have we call them fortnightly targets where we work on we assess how the last a target was working and then we make two more targets with my mentor every two weeks to then work towards um and the same and they all my lesson feedback should be partially related to those targets as well so it's kind of focused on something but in practice when you get you give my class teacher a feedback book for a lesson that goes everywhere in terms mm-hmm. of feedback and not always specifically on the thing I'm on, on that one thing but um it's not ever really explicitly about improvements to meet the teaching standards. It's improvements just improve teaching in general kind of thing. Mm, yeah. it, in fact, most of the year um, hasn't been about the teaching standards, like you should do this because it meets this teaching standard. It's only mm. really about four times a year that we actually get the teaching standards mentioned to us. Okay. That's and so the way it works for us, actually... Um, I know because I'm doing my last one now, is we co- we collect these things called rationales and evidence sheets. Um, and mm-hmm. we do them basically once a term. And we're collecting evidence, essentially for each of the teaching standards, but they've modified them slightly. Um, right. And they relate them to one of the teaching standards. Um, but it's, the way they explain it to us is that they don't want us super focused in on this is what the teaching standard is. They want us more like, general so the actual bullet points of each teaching standard we've never gone through that at university for example mm. um so in terms of targets so it's been so we at once a term we make this sheet and we're collecting evidence for how we yeah. meet this box that they've said is related to te- teaching standard six but it's got a different name in our box yeah. and we've got to find um evidence related to that and the key bit that's always emphasized to us is how has this benefited children's learning and that's the and then we relate every single bit of evidence to or every single thing that we've tried and we've done that we can do how has this benefited children's learning kind of thing um mm. but that's i mean these these four sort of um pinch points during the year when, when we look at and review our what we've done in the term i'd say there's no really real points that we look at the teaching standards Thank you. That's so interesting because uh, I was really keen to get someone that is currently training because I do imagine that the different training routes have evolved a lot. And what you said about not having the standards mentioned explicitly, that was very different (laughs) to my 
um, my training experience where, like I said earlier, it was just drummed into us. Um, so I really appreciate the fact that they are, uh, or your, um, your university is, is tweaking it so that it is for the children because that's what it's all about. It's making us great teachers for the children. And I think it, it's really important to keep that as a priority. It is about the children. Um, and I think that that is a great place for me to just bring up our sponsor for this episode, which is the Happy Confident Company. And they provide clinically approved, ready to go wellbeing and mental health programs to help pupils thrive. And it only takes 10 minutes a day. And I just think who wouldn't spend 10 minutes a day <laughs> just making sure that their mental health is is where it needs to be so that they can you know get on with the rest of their day even though it is for pupils I think as adults that's definitely something that we can benefit from as well so if you are interested head over to www.happyconfident.com to find out a bit more about what they do um so for those that have just joined our show the late show with me Tolly McCarthy welcome we are talking about teacher training and teacher standards and just how the two are, how the two play out together. Um, and I am rattling tables a little bit because I am, I feel like I might be on the verge of just getting rid of them <laughs> completely or reworking them because I do think that maybe the, the, um, standards just need a bit of tweaking bit of editing bit of updating that's the word um, because s- schools are just so different <laughs> schools are constantly evolving children are changing just generationally um, and I think it's important that our our standards and our criteria for what makes a good teacher is is always you know being assess so we can be the t- best teachers that we can be and I remember having a conversation with someone <laughs> recently who is not a teacher but um has a nephew I think it is nephew little brother a young person in year six and he went to me he said Tolu the year six is today are not the year sixes when I was in year six. <laughs> you know, he was just saying that the behaviour now, um, it, it was just shocking to him. But I don't know if it's the case that behaviour has always been the way it is now, and we because we were younger, we just didn't realise, or if generationally things are moving in a different direction. But I do feel that as teachers, we have to be equipped to deal with that. So I do want to just spend a bit of time talking about part two, which is the personal and professional conduct. Um, And I am going to read this because there are lots of lots of little things to pick out here. But it says a teacher is expected to demonstrate consistently high standards of personal and professional conduct. I was was about to interject there, but let me read the whole thing. (laughs) The following statements define the behaviour and attitudes which set the required standard for conduct throughout a teacher's career. Teachers uphold public trust in the profession and maintain high standards of ethics and behaviour within and outside school by, and then it's listing the following ways, Treating pupils with dignity, building relationships rooted in mutual respect and at all times observing proper boundaries appropriate to a teacher's professional position. Having regard for the need to safeguard pupils' well-being in accordance with statutory provisions, showing tolerance of and respect for the rights of others, not undermining fundamental British values including democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty and mutual respect, and tolerance of those with different faiths and beliefs. Ensuring that personal beliefs are not expressed in ways which exploit pupils' vulnerability or might lead them to break the law. Teachers must have proper and professional regard for the ethos, policies and practices of the school in which they teach and maintain high standards in their own attendance and punctuality. Teachers must have an understanding of and always act within the statutory frameworks which set out their professional duties and responsibilities. So there's a lot there. 
personal and professional conduct. Now, that first sentence, the first little paragraph under that heading, just stop me in my tracks for a minute and I'll read it again. It says a teacher is expected to demonstrate consistently high standards of personal and professional conduct. And I just thought, what a high standard, like what a high calling to consistently <laughs> demonstrate standards of personal and professional conduct. I just feel like our teachers not allowed to have a bad day like, ever because there are times when I do just want to leave my house looking, you know, tracksuit, hair, messy bun, whatever it is. And forget that I'm a teacher and I, I'm not interested <laughs> in having consistently high standards of professional and personal content. I want to be in my trackies, going to the supermarket and picking up what I want to pick up without thinking about, oh, how is society going to see me as a teacher? And I just thought, reading that paragraph, that whole, all those bullet points, you can tell that this hasn't been updated in a long time <laughs> because I feel now the perception of teachers it just feels like no one likes us very much I don't know what you think Andy but I just feel that that whole section there would work in a country that held teachers in high regard and I just feel like we're not being held in high regard at the moment I don't know what do you think Andy? Um, I mean from people that I talk to around my sort of age, you, you know, sort of that weird gap between university and, and you know, the professional jobs. Yeah, I think it is still kind of a, I mean, I get a lot of respect from my friends for doing it um, kind of thing, which I might be a bit of an interesting one coming from, you know, young university students kind of thing. I, I don't know. It's a bit, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure really. Yeah. No, that's fair enough. I think it it was interesting because the term that they use in the um this document is, is public trust. And I think the way teachers have been portrayed in the media, probably since I would say since COVID, it does feel like that trust isn't there. But we are still being held to this standard, you know, that says that we must you know, do all of these things. We must act professionally all the time. And, you know, we have to to have, you know, make sure that our behaviour is okay. And we have to make sure that our social media doesn't have anything inappropriate on it. Inappropriate on it. And of course, all of those things make sense. No one is saying that you should, you know, just have crazy photos on your social media for your children and students to find that's not what we're saying but it does feel like the wording of it is holding teachers to a very very high standard that isn't I personally feel might not be attainable in the way that they are portraying it to be um yes it, it does feel like teachers aren't allowed to have a bad day <laughs> um, and, and that's what I get from that part too so I do think that maybe that's something that could be edited or reworded or tweaked um, just because you know we we as teachers go through a lot and I started talking or started this show by talking about behavior and how you know, just going on social media, there's a different conversation about behaviour every day. You know, a teacher got hit in the face or something happened with two pupils in school or this came out via WhatsApp in a like a group of peers or something. There's always something happening with behaviour. And it's almost like teachers are expected to just take it, you know? And if you know heaven forbid you do something remotely human and act out or say something that you shouldn't you know this standard has now essentially fallen apart and your whole professionalism is called into question even if you've been a fantastic teacher who does all the other standards who plans and teaches well-structured lessons who adapts the teaching who does the assessment even if you've done all those things really really well you can have one bad day and it will all fall apart. And I think that is is a very, a very big thing <laughs> for teachers to have to 
to carry on their shoulders. Um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that, Andy, or if anyone else wants to jump in here um, and just talk about that, what they think about part two of the teacher standards. We'd love to hear. And you can absolutely tweet us um, or you can comment with hashtag TT radio um, or you can request to speak. We are a very friendly bunch. <laughs> You're very welcome. But um, yeah, Andy, any thoughts on on the weight of I guess just that pressure on teachers, is that something that you think you might have to deal with? Or do you think, actually, I'm pretty professional all the time, it'll be quite easy for me to to just crack on? I mean, I think, amongst other things, that's talking to people, you know, who are considering getting to teaching when they hear about, you know, like you said, the things that get leaked or things that they hear on the news about teachers and in discouraging ways like that is one of the reasons that they don't want to get into teaching because there is this um this perception of having to uphold this standard all the time or having to change uh, their lifestyle in some way or what they can do they feel mm. which is yeah that's yeah absolutely i think it's it's the changing or the concealing of a lifestyle do you think that's something that teachers should have to do um yeah I mean I think I hear from some people at different schools who you know they they want to be able to wear clothes in a certain way even though they're teaching in a school they don't they're not allowed to show they're not allowed to wear certain clothes or they're not allowed to you know be able to show their tattoos or things like that um Mm -hmm. which for some people um a lot of young people like me going into teaching that is something that they do think about like is or my beliefs appropriate kind of thing, or will they be accepted in a teaching way? That's Is that going to affect me going into teaching? That can, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I would love, I mean, this is a, a teacher's <laughs> radio station, but I think this is where I would love to hear from other professions because I don't know if the same standards apply to other professions because god forbid sally from hr in marketing or whatever (laughs) rocks up to work with her tattoos and and piercings and pink colored hair or whatever it might be has her instagram where she's got you know gone on a night out i'm sure no one would hear about it i don't think anyone would blink twice but is it the fact that we work with young people because if it is then our youth workers held to that same standard our speech and language therapists held held to that same standard I mean I can't speak for other professions I don't know but I do think that's quite interesting um oh so I'm just going to read some tweets that we've got so Fabian has said I missed the start of the show is it the teacher standards document you are speaking about yes it is Fabian so we've just been speaking about teacher standards and I've been speaking to the lovely Andy about his teacher training experience and seeing if the teacher standards have um been a big part of his his teaching experience his training experience should I say um yes so that's what we are talking about but um yes again other professions I can't speak for them but it would be interesting to know if they are held to that same standard because it feels like a lot of weight to carry for a profession that at the moment seems to be getting thrown under the bus a lot of the time. Um, It's interesting though, because I am from Nigeria and teachers are held in very high regard over there, at least they were at a time. And, you know, if you told anybody in Nigeria that you were a teacher, oh, my goodness, the respect you would get. <laughs> uh, so maybe I should have gone back, to be honest. But, um, it, yeah, it, it's such a different culture. Um, it, it's just contrasting the two, the two countries. And I don't know that they have any standards in the same way that we do here. But it's just very highly respected. So I, I would imagine that it would be easy <laughs> for them over there to to keep up with part two um but we do have a tweet here that says regarding the part two standards it makes sense to uphold certain behaviors when you're in school in a position of responsibility but it's not really written with our connected social media world in mind i guess ideally you'd think teachers deserve separate 
lives away from the job. Yes. <laughs> and this is what I was guessing at. I do think these standards need some kind of updating. I think we've evolved past where this this point basically. I do think there needs to be something about social media. There needs to be something about well-being. You know, something about mental health as well. That's not mentioned anywhere in the standards. Um and maybe it's just that it wasn't a priority back then. But I do feel like you can only be as good of a teacher as you are in yourself, if that makes sense. That was very badly worded. I do apologise. But, yeah, you know, you have to be well mentally, physically. It's, it's a demanding job. And, you, of course, you will be a brilliant teacher if mentally you are you are sound. And that's not talking about neurodivergence. That's a different thing. I'm talking about, you know, just your own state of mind and how you feel in yourself. I don't know what you'd say about that, Andy. Um, have you come across well-being and mental health in your training at all? Has that been mentioned at any point? I think it's something that... Um mentioned briefly at the start here's where you can go to on your course when you're not you know it's all become too much you need to go and do this kind of thing and there are these expectations um i mean as part of our course one of our friday sessions the entire day was dedicated to well-being they called it a well-being day um Mm. which half of it was sort of well-being for children and then well-being for children we teach and then well-being for us as teachers but it was a wasn't uh I, I, I didn't get too much out of it apart from you if you need to reach out to for us because we're trainees you need to reach out to our mentor your tutor those sort of people first um so i don't really know how it fits too well in terms of you know a fully qualified teacher who doesn't have that that mentor mm-hmm. or someone responsible for them in that same training capacity. Mm -hmm. This program has been brought to you by The Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready to go, wellbeing and mental health program will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and wellbeing tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. Yeah, I mean it's good that they've they've mentioned that for for your cohort. Um, I know a lot of schools nowadays they'll have like a well-being ambassador or someone in charge of, of staff well-being. Um, and if that's something that's important to you, maybe when you're doing interviews, if you haven't got a job already, that might be something worth asking about. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of schools do just have it as lip service. It's something they say they have, but how well it actually works and how well it's embedded into the school system is a different thing. But it's definitely worth looking out for Um, because it is important. I think, yes, as teachers, we are absolutely there for the well-being of our students, but we do have to take care of ourselves as well. Um, Just looking at the tweets now, Mr Kemp has said, from other jobs I've worked, I would say our standards of professionalism are way higher. Okay, interesting. It's a safeguarding issue. So right that our standards in front of teachers are sky high. Out of children's view, however, we all need a release just kept off socials. That is a very good point as well. Um, And I'm glad to know that our our standards of professionalism are way higher. well, I say glad. I mean, I was right. <laughs> That's why I'm glad. But um, yeah, it is interesting. And I suppose it is just that we we work with young minds. Um, oh, Mr. Kemp has gone on to say hair and tattoos should never matter, though. Have pink hair and all the tattoos you want as long as you act well. Absolutely. I think I'm completely on board with that. I know teachers that have sleeves and piercings, hair, one leg shorter than the other whatever it might be brilliant teachers it has no bearing on their ability to teach um so yeah i i'm all for that and it is interesting that that schools have different policies on that i know some schools are quite relaxed about dress and um yeah the dress code and and how you present yourself 
whereas some schools are suit and tie <laughs> every day, you know, smart formal wear. So, yeah, it is interesting how every school determines what is professional um, and, yeah, how it impacts teaching. It does remind me of, and I don't know if you've come across this, Andy, because you work in secondary school. I don't know if you've had any cheeky ones, but I know when I was teaching in secondary school, the boys had to take their coats off and it was always that smart Alec comment, oh, but my coat isn't stopping me from learning this. And it was hard to argue. <laughs> it was hard to argue. I don't know if you've come across that, Andy. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a fair bit of that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, amazing. But I do have to ask, um, what has your... Oh, you might you might need some thinking time. But what's been your funniest moment on your or in your training? Because I can imagine secondary well, I don't need to imagine I've done it, but secondary school has has given me some of my funniest stories. So I'm wondering if there's been a moment where you've just thought that was absolutely brilliant. Um hmm trying to think of what comes to mind one that happened recently and i i finally realized straight afterwards oh probably could have taught that in a better way to avoid this happening but um (laughs) (laughs) we um was doing a science practical where the kids had to draw a magnetic field around a magnet they put on a piece of paper and so i showed them under the visualizer um you know i put i got this nice worksheet for them i measured the magnets and made the worksheet so it fit the magnet i said put the magnet in the middle of the worksheet put the north and south so you remember and then with a plotting compass they were going to put the compass on different circles around and then draw the arrow to show the Mm -hmm. arrow that it was going so it would draw the magnetic field now the only thing that was an issue was that they had to put the magnet onto the square and then take it off so they could put north and south so they could remember which was north and south when they take the magnet off um, Mm -hmm. and then put it back on Um, so I showed them the visualize what they had to do I thought I explained it really well Um, Five minutes later, uh, someone someone's going, sir, sir. So I turn around and he says, no, my magnet, uh, my compass isn't is, is pointing the same direction everywhere I go. And I'm just thinking, oh, maybe the mag- uh, the compass is broken. I come over to his table and he's just left. His magnet isn't even on his sheet at this point. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> he had put it on, drawn around uh, and took it off, put north and south and then was putting the compass around it. And that was one that did make me smile. And it was, yeah, it made me giggle a little oh, bit. Gosh. But... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> definitely, I think teacher training, it really, I mean, it's just a great time to make mistakes, isn't it? Because you will think that you've explained something really well, you've planned a lesson really well, and then you stand in front of the class and you deliver that thing and you just think, okay we need to go to the drawing board (laughs) um but yeah I do find that students a lot of the time or at least the ones I've come across they they can be quite gracious and they will just kind of let you let you sort it out and and they won't make too too much of a fuss um but that does sound quite fun that you get to do experiments and practicals I don't remember the last time I did a science practical but um I'm sure that must be really enjoyable for you yeah it is i mean it's a little bit stressful as well um particularly when it's it's one of the things i need to work on it's just um how am i arranging these practicals um how am i going to get the equipment or how am i doing it safely and then not even getting into the when i'm teaching the kids why are we doing a practical why are we doing each step what is Mm -hmm. it showing us kind of thing and then having them explain it as opposed to just we did this because you told us to basically kind of thing you know it's 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 a bit stressful in that way um but it's it's fun and the best lessons i had or well, a few of the best lessons are the ones where they, we've done a practical and and the kids have done whoa i wasn't expecting that to happen kind of thing or oh mm-hmm. certainly tell me why this happened mm. um it, those have been the ones that is like oh that's genuinely that sort of made me smile and yeah yeah oh brilliant well, long may that continue for you. <laughs> we love catching those those mind blowing moments with with our students. Uh, but we do have a tweet here that says, "With the teacher standards in general, 
I wonder if we set the bar too high in terms of the unrelenting demands of always being at our very best. No professional can always be at the absolute top of their game. Some days we're just good enough and that should be fine. And I don't mean in terms of safeguarding, just general teaching. Um, That's a very good point. I do feel that, and again, can't speak for other professions, but as teachers, sometimes we... We just want to be great all the time. (laughs) And, you know, we want to go above and beyond for our students. We want to, sometimes we just want to prove ourselves as well. But it's hard to do that consistently. And we can set the bar really high for ourselves. And when we don't meet it, it can feel like we're not good teachers or it it can really just put us in in a tizzy. Um, So I think that's a very valid point that has been made. And it reminds me of a meme (laughs) I saw recently where someone, I think it must have been someone in SLT or something speaking to another teacher. And he asked her, um, he was holding, or she was, one of them was holding up a blank piece of paper. And he asked, where are your lesson plans? Why is the paper blank? (laughs) And she responds to him, like, we've got six weeks left. I'm just trying to survive. And haven't we all been there? <laughs> um, and it's true, I think, as teachers, it, we do hold ourselves to a high standard. And, you know, I started off the show saying that since teaching, I haven't actively heard any of these standards being mentioned since my training year. And maybe it's good that we don't hear it every day because. If I had someone reminding me every day that I have to set high expectations, I have to make accurate and productive use of assessment, I have to manage behaviour effectively, I need to fulfil my wider professional responsibilities and all of those things. If I heard that regularly, I might feel overwhelmed because it does sound like a lot to do. But when you've been teaching for so long, I mean, this it, that is the job. It's basically the job on paper. It's not everything because we all know that teachers do a lot more than just teach. But maybe it's a good thing that it's not lauded over us the way it was in my training year, because it is it is a lot. And if you think about it to that level of detail, it it you would just crush like you'd be crushed under the weight of that pressure. So thank you for raising that point to feed. Much appreciated. Um, right, we are slowly coming to the end of the show, but it is Wednesday and I like to do well-being Wednesdays. So, Andy, could you please tell us what you do to wind down? How do you take care of your well-being and your mental health? Um, I think today was a bit of a, an exception um, for me because usually it's, you know, I, I'd like to get exercise and go for a run. Uh, afterwards when I get back after dinner kind of thing and particularly when the longer days it's a lot easier um Mm -hmm. it kind of came to a head though today and I'm really thankful for my school and the support network that I'm in because I had a pretty awful day today Mm -hmm. in terms of the lessons that I was teaching and it just felt like oh and then it suddenly came to a point of realizing oh I'm at the end of my course and I'm still having awful you know I'm having these awful lessons and these awful things happen kind of thing where it could be way better and it has got me a bit. I got a bit of a, a bit nervous because was thinking about September when I'm going to be an ECT and part of a team and working on an even bigger timetable kind of thing. Mm. Um, so it was quite nice. I was able to. I was going. I went to go talk to my professional mentor at school today, and we just had a long two-hour chat, which I was really grateful for. We just sort of like because she also handles the ECTs at, at that school as well, and she's she knows the school that I'm going to. It was just nice that we had this. You know, I could offload a lot today, which was really, really mm-hmm. helpful. And she was really, really um, good with that. So that was really, for me, but that doesn't happen every every, every Wednesday. But um, <laughs> it was it was nice to just sort of offload a lot of, uh, a lot of nerves that's all just built up. Yeah. Mm, of course. Yeah, I mean, I think that is the thing with teaching. It's like we were just saying, there are days where, you're just good enough (laughs) there are days where you are just scraping by there are days where you are crying under a table in a cupboard 
there are days that go really really well um it absolutely does not stop and I'm sure this is I'm not telling you anything new per se but teaching is just one of those jobs you have really great days and you have days that aren't so great um and I'm sure that's most professions to be honest that isn't just exclusive to teaching but yes I say that to say don't don't worry about it (laughs) it won't be the worst day you ever have um you know it's not the first and it won't be the last but but it does get better so there is that um but you did you mentioned that you like to go go running when did you start that um yeah truthfully like it's just been a sort of every now and then when I've been able to I mean it's got a little bit better I think maybe since Easter half term that I've been really trying to get into it consistently it's Mm. one of those things that I've sort of lost since the summer before teaching and then teaching and then you know getting to the darker months yes it gets a bit more difficult and then it gets to a Saturday and it's oh there's anything that I want to do the workload's so high with the PDC sometimes that it's just yeah yeah. but yeah no it's it's better now and it's been one of the things that has cheered me up oh amazing Do you find it difficult to switch off from your PGCE and and school and all of those kind of things? Or are you quite okay to say, right, I'm leaving now, I'm going home and this is what I'm doing? Um, I I would say I I personally struggle to switch off just as much. Maybe for like an hour a day I've switched off. But I I think I'm in my back of my mind because... Not to take it away from from well being and things like that, a lot of the PGC and particularly the way that the start of it's sort of taught in my course, you know, it's a solid two weeks of being in university and being told this is what the academia says, this is what the literature says, sorry, and this is the best way to do things, kind of. And mm-hmm. suddenly there's this high expectation when you come into school and it's like, oh, I need to plan a lesson that's going to do all these things because this is the best way to do it and these expectations and so many things that um you're always I always get to this point where I feel like I'm chasing some pedestal that I know they're a year into teaching and I'm trying to watch teachers that I've taught for 20 years mm. doing all those things that I've been told are really 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 good and almost like the best possible thing and it's yeah I don't know that's sort of um one of the challenges that I think and mm particularly when during the trainee year the two-week cycle of setting your targets you should be evaluating our lessons kind of thing it, it does bear on my mind a little bit um mm. particularly when with the you know the reduced workload compared to an ECT there's a lot of time to to think almost yeah and reflect which is mm-hmm. one way a really good thing but in another way it's like Sometimes I just would just like to just get okay, it out a bad lesson. Let's teach another one, kind of get some momentum going, as opposed to I've taught one lesson today. Now I've got two free periods to, to not to, 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 yeah, to bubble up or to worry about it, kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's one of those things that I've thought. Mm, that's interesting, actually, and. I yeah not as I'm thinking about unpacking it as you're saying and it, it, it's a really good point actually because sometimes like I remember having an observation of a really bad lesson and it's like okay now we have to sit and talk about this bad lesson <laughs> it's just like okay I know it's bad can I just go now <laughs> and it's true you do have that time to kind of sit and think about all the ways it was either really good or really bad depending on which way it went um when sometimes what you want to do is just get on to the next thing and that's that's quite interesting actually I think I'm going to have to to sit with that one and think is that how I deal with negativity in general <laughs> it's like hmm, just opened up some um some therapeutic doors there Andy without meaning to for me <laughs> how do I deal with negative things because even now I have lessons that go wrong and you're quite right there isn't time for me to sit a mullet over unless it was something really drastic that I get through my whole day and then once everything's done I'm thinking oh I really messed up there but that's quite unlikely but um 
it's true like when you're so busy you just don't really have time to sit and dwell um but I think that is one good thing about training and you know just having the time to make those mistakes because you're you're allowed to get it wrong if that makes sense yeah yeah um so yeah honestly make all the mistakes you want now Classroom, if you want, explode something, it's fine. <laughs> but <laughs> me, you're an ECT, <laughs> might want to reconsider that one. But um, yeah, it sounds like you've yeah, it sounds like you've got this. You know, you've made it to the end, which is which is a big deal. Well, almost to the end, because um, I remember my PTC in our WhatsApp group. Every other day, I was hearing that someone else had dropped out. Um, so for you to have made it this far is is very impressive and I commend you. Um I you you found your school for September, haven't you? You did uh, yeah. mention that. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Well, congratulations. Um I hope it does meet your expectations and yeah, I'm sure you'll be great. Cheers, thank you. Um, well yes, we have come to the end of our show almost. Um, I want to say a massive thank you to you, Andy, and to all our listeners. Thank you to Daffid, Mr. Kemp, Fabian, um, Lucy, our host as always, <laughs> and everyone that has taken the time to tune in um, and just really go through these standards and just unpack them a little bit. I think as teachers, you know, we do all of these things that on that are written on paper we, we don't think about it so much but we are absolutely doing it you know we're doing the differentiation we're being professional we're setting high expectations and promoting good progress that is what we do every single day you know and we deserve to be applauded for that we deserve the accolades we do um so if no one else gives them to you i am giving them to you um but i do think there is room for for improvement with what we've got on paper especially as we are having a new generation of teachers rising up um you know these standards may might be a little a little outdated not in that anything needs to be removed because that is our job this is what we do we do all of these things but maybe there there needs to be some additions i would say so i think we will leave it there but before we disappear, I would like to draw your attention once again to our sponsor for today's episode, which is the Happy Confident Company, who provide clinically approved, ready to go well-being and mental health programs to help your pupils thrive in only 10 minutes a day. I did have a, a look at their website and I saw that Emma Willis is involved in the Happy Confident Company. And I know she does. Oh, she has that baby program. I cannot remember what it's called. Delivering babies? Something with babies. And as the owner of a baby, I support all things to do with babies. So if Emma Willis is involved, I love it. (laughs) So definitely do head over to the website, www.happyconfident.com to find out more. I think it's so important to get our children happy and healthy and if it will only take you 10 minutes to make a positive difference then why would you not do it so head over to that website and check it out thank you so much for tuning in and i will be with you again in another two weeks i'm not sure what we will be discussing just yet I do have a list somewhere. I need to dig it out. I remember you, Lucy, mentioning that you had a list. And I also had a list. And like you, I don't know where my list has gone. So (laughs) I will need to spend some time finding that list. But I will be back with you in two weeks for another great show. So do take care. Have a lovely rest of the week. Make sure you take care of your mental health. And see if you can make somebody smile this week. Thank you again to our guest, Andy. It's been lovely to have you and all the best with your teaching career. 